So I think we first um, would like to give Neil and also um, Ali Risa the possibility to present themselves, also uh, Timo being a lawyer. So this is a panel where we have decided to talk about the regulatory fundament uh, that's basically done by uh, Timo Bernau from GSK, a law firm, and also by Ali Reza Siadat uh, from Anerton, another law firm, and then Neil working in the custody business and Shemus also working in the, in the custody business. You already heard uh, Shemus previously and uh, Shemus you can have, have now also the possibility to uh, basically complete the messages uh, which, you, um, which were cut a little bit due to our very tight schedule, uh, but we, you will give, have enough room to basically continue uh, with the key messages of institutional adoption later on. Okay, uh, maybe, maybe you quickly start uh, presenting yourself um, to basically such that everybody knows who's talking here. Yeah, great. Good morning, everybody. My name is Neil Fillery. I'm one of the founders at DAX, um, DACS, Digital Asset Custody Services. Uh, we're a, a technology provider um, for the life cycle of digital assets. Um, we provide infrastructure from a software and a hardware perspective. Uh, we have a strategic partnership with IBM where we build uh, a proprietary software stack on top of IBM's uh, highest grade hardware uh, to bring our experiences in, uh, in capital markets and uh, traditional asset world to the digital asset space as well. So we combine our backgrounds. Um, my personal background is um, within the capital market space, having spent 15 years in the large banks. Um, and then I left in 2014 and actually got into crypto in 2014. Um, my my co-founder at DAX was mining Bitcoin in 2010, so we got early exposure to the asset class. Um, we launched a hedge fund, the first uh, CFTC-regulated, NFA-approved hedge fund out of the US. And that's when we really felt there was a demand for infrastructure around the space to support our investing in, in digital assets uh, as we launched our fund. Uh, back then in, in 2016, the no, no custody providers we looked at uh, um, could meet our requirements. It was very difficult to get a bank account in this space. The whole story that everybody knows. Uh, very challenging uh, to, to find the right infrastructure. So we embarked on investing and building companies uh, in and around the space. And one of those companies is, is DAX. Thank you. Excellent. Okay, so uh, we have to clarify exactly, you know, the positioning of uh, Metaco and you two, such that the audience is basically seeing exactly the difference. We will do this in a second. Um, then maybe uh, Ali Risa, please also present yourself, and then Timo. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm very sorry that today I cannot be there physically by myself. I just yesterday got um, uh, an, an illness, a flu, and with corona symptoms, therefore <laughs> it was better not to show up personally at the event, which I very much regret, but for uh, safety issues, this was the only possibility. But thank you, uh, Philip and your team for setting up this hybrid format where I still can participate with the others. So I'm Al Reza, I'm a lawyer from Frankfurt. I'm doing regulatory advice and I'm focusing on Bitcoin and crypto since 2014. I'm advising banks, financial institutions, but also startups as well as uh, other uh, fintechs who are into crypto. Um, and besides uh, advising from a legal perspective, I'm also a member of uh, several associations such as the German Bundesblock, uh, the uh, Luxembourg Think Block Tank, as well as the uh, uh, European Commission's Blockchain Association in NATPA, where we are involved in the MICA, and, but also involved in the German regulation coming, which is the uh, Electronic uh, Securities uh, Act. I'm happy here today to talk to you and to uh, dip deeper in these topics. Excellent. Maybe Ali Reza is in a hospital. We cannot see it because you were using the virtual background <laughs> uh, feature, right? Who knows? Uh, but uh, good to have you still here, even with uh, with the flu. Uh, that's uh, that's pretty pretty good. Um, and thanks for not coming. Actually, you know how it is. If somebody is just having a flu and coughing out there, then everybody's shocked, uh, even if it's not Corona. Uh, so therefore, it's 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 very uh, kind of nice and polite. Um, but uh, still great to have you here. Okay, Timo, please also present you and uh, GSK. Thanks a lot, Philip. Yeah, I'll, I'll try to make it short so we have more time to focus on the content. Uh, so my name is uh, Timo Bernau. I'm from GSK, um, law firm based in Germany and Luxembourg. And I'm a banking lawyer, so I do everything which is uh, related to banking, financial services. And I'm in blockchain since uh, 2016, so probably the youngest here. And um, yeah, I'm happy to be there, at least online. I was trying to come, 
but um, as, as many, many have the same problems, um, I'm, I'm very happy that, uh, Philip, you had uh, the idea to do this uh, remote uh, channel as well. So, so happy to be here um, online. Excellent. Thanks very much. So, as I said, we have uh, two lawyers and two tech companies. Um, maybe let's start with the custody business model in the future. We have uh, large-scale custodians out there, such as uh, State Street and others. They are not doing crypto custody yet. They are exploring it, doing PowerPoint and so on, but they are not uh, like doing programming. They are not coding. And they are, at this point of time, staying still away from it. Then we have smaller banks, um, Bankhaus Scheich, Bank von der Heid, and others in Germany um, who are now approaching it, uh, getting in touch with the technology and so on. So they are entering the market with their banking license. Then we have um, custody regulated custody providers who have the tech plus the license. That's basically those companies who want to sell directly to the customer, putting their tech, for example, in an app and having the license. And then we have companies, for example, like Metaco, who have just the tech, but in a different way, being it cloud-based or on-premise, uh, but not the license with the goal of supplying regulated entities who are not having the tech, like a puzzle piece, right? Um, that's how I understood uh, Metaco. Um, how is uh, DAX basically fitting in here the same way? You also do not want to have the license yourself, right? You would like to supply uh, existing um, regulated companies or existing custodians, correct? So such that you get a feeling of how these business models work. Yeah, that's correct. I mean, DAX as a business never had the intention of being a qualified custodian in any jurisdiction. Um, the plan was always to be a back-end technology provider to bring the solution to the market. Um, we bring our expertise on the blockchain space around value-added services on top of the security layer of our um, partnership with IBM. So we, we chose IBM as a vendor uh, for many reasons, but um, primarily in terms of financial-based transactions around the world, um, IBM is probably the biggest player in terms of uh, size and scale. I mean, they, they have relationships with over 90% of the largest banks in the world in terms of their mainframe technology and how they implement that into the banks. And we carefully selected them and brought custody to IBM. Um, this was at the back end of 2018. Um, and we're now sort of building our software stack on their HyperProtect virtual service platform, which is where they secure all their private keys. So we, we definitely don't want to be a qualified custodian. We want to partner with firms that do have licenses. Um, and we've seen, obviously, that's been mentioned over the last couple of days, um, the regulatory framework and the landscape uh, this year has really opened up with the OCC's announcement. You have several perhaps smaller jurisdictions like Liechtenstein and Malta that have got digital asset frameworks uh, that they've brought out. Um, we've seen one in Mauritius quite recently whereby they've got an extensive uh, regulatory framework for digital assets. So where there's demand, we want to be into those countries, and, but we're, yeah, we're not going to be a, a, a custodian. Yeah, excellent. So this is uh, comparable to Metaco. Metaco, uh, you supply your tech as far as I know. I hope I can say this to uh, Börse Stuttgart, which is a regulated entity, right? Uh, you're also partnering with IBM as far as I know. So uh, how, how is basically the, the panelists are seeing um, this entire industry evolving? Is it how will banks basically deciding, will be banks overrun by smaller, more agile players? Or do they have more time to wait and then basically adopting, maybe even acquiring uh, custody tech? What, what would be your expectation? Or is basically the entire market opening up such that you have small players profit, uh, profitably working and large players um, working side by side? So how would you expect this industry to emerge in the next one or two years? Who would like to take this question? Sure, happy to jump in. I'm, okay. So, I mean, I, I think that there's there's a more fundamental question, I think, and I, I obviously just went through a presentation around, you know, banks building business case in the space. And I think it's early days, I think, is the main message. And I think for not all firms, to your point around the PowerPoint, you know, a lot of firms are still circulating PowerPoints around custody. I don't think it's yet a strategic pillar around their spend, basically. So I think that's one of the reasons that what we're seeing right now is firms want to experiment in this space, they do POCs or they partner with companies that make it easy to, to build out the use cases and build some understanding, which is why I think you know, we're seeing traction with smaller, cust let's say startup custodians in this bank space, banks partner with them. For me, I think that's more of a tactical solution. I think there's a lot of tactical learning in the market right now. 
I think when the, as, as I said, I think we're at an inflection point from a demand perspective and institutionalization of the asset class. But so I think we will move probably in the next year to a more strategic sort of focus on this. And I, you know, talk to banks, and I think there's definitely at the highest level of some of the firms that I would never expected. There's a commitment at the exco level to get involved in cryptos now. Um, so that spend is coming. They're slow moving to decide these things. Those budgets have been decided now. I think 2021, 2022 is seeing that you know, production plans become a reality. And I think the, the question will be less about externalizing. Um, obviously, for some firms, it's, it will, will externalize because it's not really strategic. They may be looking at other services. But for those that are in the custody business, it'll be strategic to have this kind of foundation part of the stack integrated with their core infrastructure. So they may build it themselves. I don't think many firms have the capability to burn, build it themselves. I mean, there's issues around getting the talent, keeping the talent. I mean, you look at some of the large firms, they start with the talent, this talent spins off into their own startups. So it, it's tough keeping the talent. Um, but I think ultimately there's, there's a strong role for, for ourselves, for companies like DAX, basically to partner with the banks and, and provide them the infrastructure. We're specialist firms that keep up to date in this space, this fast moving space, and enable them to securely integrate, manage, and provide a foundation so they can basically get into the you know the staking, get into the DeFi. You know, the banks have a have a role, and I think they will build to be part of that role. They will build into the space to have a very strategic role in the space. Okay, you want to add um, uh, two more words? Yeah, just to add to that, I think um, I agree with Seamus. I think um, uh, the the big word around this has been compliance, right? So we we approached a lot of the large banks in 2018, and of course, a large custodian like State Street or Bank of New York Mellon, who have you know trillions of dollars of traditional assets, to make a decision to shift to become a custody provider for the digital asset space is a is a big move, given how how effectively small the market size is of, of crypto assets today compared to traditional assets. But they're starting to see now, you know, the, the shifts in the regulatory landscape is opening up these firms to really take a closer look under the hood to see how they can customize a, a, a custody solution for their clients. Um, and now nearly every player is, uh, is, is, is to the market with this, this sentiment. Okay. Um, okay, now let's turn toward the law situation. So uh, we have the crypto assets, um, which are already partly regulated, then there is the Mika regulation coming up, right? And then we have um, securities regulation also coming up local in Germany, and also with the pilot regime in, from an infrastructure perspective also in Europe. Who of you guys, Ali Risa and Timo, Timo would uh, like to quickly uh, uh, sketch out the current scene and the way to go for both crypto assets and um, digital securities in a very, very, very brief way. What, is, what are the top three important points here? Mm -hmm. I mean, Larissa, if you, yeah, you just start, okay, it's okay. Yeah, okay, please. let me just start and then you just add with whatever, if I missed something. So uh, what, what we have in Germany, we have a, uh, we have a, we have a law in the, in the German Banking Act, we have a legal uh, clarity which says that crypto assets are regulated, crypto custody service is regulated, you need a license for that. So Germany has implemented the fifth uh, anti-money laundering directive in a, in a very, um, I would say, very tough way because we have added uh, the licensing regime for crypto assets but also for crypto custody service. But as, as we can see now from the, from the Mika, so the European uh, European regulation, which is coming, this was, uh, I would say, a, a blue pause, uh, something which the European Commission is now looking at and trying to implement also on a European level. So we're going to have probably for all the EA member states regulation of crypto assets, but also for the crypto custody service. And what we're also going to face in Germany with the implementation of the Electronic Securities Act is going to be a regulation of um, crypto assets, which uh, makes crypto assets similar to uh, securities, to traditional securities. Uh, so the civil law is going to change, but at the same time, we will have in the Banking Act uh, another, an additional licensing for the um, for the register uh, for the register um, keeper or for, the, for for those who do um, do the register for crypto assets as well as for electronic securities. Um, so this is something which we're going to face probably already in the beginning of 2021. And Mika, um, hopefully coming in within the next two till three years, is then going to add for the European level some more regulation. Excellent, uh, Timo, you want to add something on uh, this point? I. Uh 
Um, yes, um, I just want to want to um, try to answer your your, your question, and I think what Elisa just pointed out is a is a good uh, a key element here. Um, as we have on the one one side, we have the the tech players. On the other, we have the the highly regulated um, banking institutions. And for the moment, I would say uh, tech is key. Um, but um, you need to have uh, um, yeah, an agreement or cooperation uh, with, with the bank because you need the regulation at least for, for a couple of services here. And as Ali Riza pointed out, there's, there's uh, getting um, more and more regulation in the different fields of custody, of uh, transactions, of um, identities. So, so um, we see a very high regulation coming up on the national level as well as the European level. So the question will be, um, what will be key in the future? Is it, is it the compliance, the, the, the regulation, or is it the tech? Maybe it's both, because if you see how, how many regulations we have um, leaving crypto assets aside, just on a general scale for, for banking institutions or any financial institutions, IT-driven regulation, we just see, I think it was pointed out a couple of times yesterday about the BIET, so the... Um, requirements for banks on the IT. There's uh, just a new consultation out um, with a fully new section on information security. So I, I think the future um, we will see, even if you are not a regulated company, but you're working together with a regulated company, which as Ariza pointed out, will be required more and more. Even if you are not a regulated company, you need to fulfill a lot of, let's say, regulation, at least at the end of the day, because the uh, regulated company will uh, give, let's say, um, their own requirements uh, in, in the, in the um, contract, uh, um, will forward it to you, so you will have to comply with it, and that's, that's uh, let's say, uh, uh, regulation as well. Okay. Um, so if... Uh I, I'm not a lawyer, right? But uh, I feel that the following is happening. You have standard securities law. This is evolving, digitally transforming, and it's, of course, capturing 99.9% of the market, right? Like a huge silo. And next to this silo, you have the crypto world emerging with own rules, own speeds, maybe even more speedier than the legacy world, potentially, let's see. Um, and if I were now a bank, right, what should I do? Should I go in this speedy... Uh, crypto assets world with own laws to experiment with the custody to be able to basically hold some value even if it's Bitcoin, right? Or should I go in the legacy world, be a little bit more slower but capture the lion's share of the market even though it's lower? But if I'm going in the legacy world, then maybe I'm missing the train on the custody tech because this is driven by the crypto world. So if I were a bank, what should I do? Maybe we ask every, everybody of you, you are, you are advising clients, you have clients and so on. So maybe um, everybody gives his recommendation for a bank. What should the bank do? Yeah, I, I think there's a, a, a real realization for banks now to behave a little bit more like technology companies. There's a real um, multi-generational shift in the way we think about you know, moving value around the world and transacting. You've only got to look at the recent um, Ant Financial IPO, which uh, was about 350 billion in terms of oversubscribed IPO. You compare that to one of the largest banks in the world, which is JP Morgan, which is the same market cap, right? So and JP Morgan's been around a long time. So for me, that just tells you that technology is driving change through financial institutions, you know, things like Alipay within Ant Financial and, and, and you know, Technology drives a lot of the thinking now, and I think that also is the same for the regulators. If they can work in harmony and get, you know, ensure that the technology is driving some of the regulatory decisions, I think that's that that's a big uh, key for for banks. But I think yeah, you've got to affect this change now. This transformation is coming, and it's inevitable that you know assets are going to become tokenized. And whether it's blockchain, AI, or data analytics, or new technologies, I think you have to start adopting these technologies in the banks. Okay, excellent. Um, any other advice from uh, Shimas or? Yeah, sure. So, I mean, I think you're going to the, the essence of the theme of my, the keynote speech I gave earlier, basically. I think, you know, we, the banks can wait quite a while. There's still a lot of frictions. I mean, I think we, there's still a lot of open questions. Is, are, is the tokenization space going to be in public ledgers? Is it going to be permission ledgers? You know, when, when is there going to be liquidity? These are questions that are, are hard to answer and uh, you can spend too long waiting and maybe miss the boat. As you say, the, the digitally native firms become more of a threat as time goes because they grow and they take advantage of these opportunities. So I don't think it's a foregone conclusion if you wait and wait that you can still capitalize on the opportunity later. So I think the question is, what can they do now? And I think, um, I don't think the crypto space is completely homogenous. I mean, obviously there's some very fast moving spaces. I mean, I, 
Um, I would no would in no instance say banks should get set up and start harvest you know um, yield yield farming you know yam yam or sushi swap or what any of the, any of the latest DeFi and whatever is coming out uh, one day to the next. I think there are, are some established asset classes which are liquid and are viewed as investable asset classes now. As I mentioned, I think there's probably two that are really there. I mean, you're talking about Bitcoin, Ethereum. I think it really drops off significantly after that. And I think the banks can make a business case on some of the top cryptos, get the learning, build the infrastructure. In the end, the the requirements for permission ledgers or the tokenization are going to be a subset of those requirements, basically. If it's permission, basically, there's less security requirements, but you still need some governance. You need basically an interoperable with both sides. Um, you know, look at the stable coin market. It, it could, but there's private initiatives that are going to be on, on blockchains. The CBDC may not be. You need a system. They need it. They need to have learnings now because it's very unclear which way it's going to go, but you need infrastructure that's going to accommodate to it. So I think one of the main things is even if the market's small, learning how the space operates internally for internal stakeholders is a non-trivial exercise. We, when we do exercise with the banks, the big problem is now they go to the, they go from the innovation department to the business. The business has no idea what they're looking at. So they need to learn now because when the market's really kicking off, let's say in the, in the security token space or the just capital markets are all tokenized, they will be too far behind. I think there's a great opportunity that they can decide now that they can build a business case and start their learning journey with things like Bitcoin and Ethereum. So you would vote for not an absolute urgency to now start overnight up until tomorrow, so there is some time uh, to get uh, started, right? Uh, but you should start now and not wait uh, too long, right? Timo well, and uh, Alirisa, what, what's... I would, just, I would just caveat that, no yeah. one start now. <laughs> So, okay. Perfect. Yeah. I mean, okay, what, what I mean, what the regulator wants to see that that uh, you understand what you do. So, so, so you need to get expertise in the different fields of of of, of the technical uh, systems you you want to use. Um, that's the one side. So you need to build up experience to prove to BaFin. Um, however, of course, you need to focus on the client needs. So you need to check what your clients want to see and what the business case is. So, so you. <laughs> Do, do not try everything, but but uh, get familiar with with the uh, technology and uh, try to find out your clients' needs. Okay, and Ali Risa, what's your comment on this? Yeah, I, I mean, I would I would uh, fully agree to you guys, uh, and there's. Actually, one point I want to, to highlight to you, this is what I have experienced with the introduction of the German German regulation of the licensing regime for the crypto custody service. And I was advising one of the biggest uh, um, crypto exchanges worldwide, which was actually looking to, uh, to leave the German market because they were, they were saying that the German market is too strict and they're not clear enough on the regulation. And then when the regulation of the crypto Uh, crypto custody regime came into in Germany, so it was very much clear what is expected from the players. So the li the license itself, and also what is expected with respect to 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 own capital, to to managing directors' expertise, and so on and so on. So this uh, this client of mine, this major crypto exchange, uh, they they made a U-turn and they uh, applied for the crypto custody license, and they said, okay, we are, we are fully committed to enter the, the the German market, and this is like one of the uh, biggest crypto exchanges uh, which did this so what i'm trying to say here is that regulation and also the, the communication of the german regulator was beneficial for uh, for for both not just for for the, for the consumers who who now have regulation and and have some someone who's looking at it so some supervisory body but also for the players who said okay now we have some 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 clear guidelines and some, some clear rules and this is how we want to do business Excellent. I think that's clear advice. Um, my personal opinion is that the, the route towards digital asset is necessarily bypassing uh, Bitcoin and Ethereum. There is no other way around because you cannot exercise digital assets because there are hardly any out there. So in case you do want to do exercises, then the only way to do it now is uh, Bitcoin and Ethereum. This is something uh, which very often banks uh, uh, are not accepting and do not want to have. And then uh, this way towards digital assets to some degree is, in my personal opinion, is locked, uh, right? Uh, because it's bypassing crypto assets uh, strangely, right? But it's just my opinion. We have to close this uh, panel discussion at this point of time. I think that was uh, very interesting to sort out asset classes to um, also sort out potential routes towards exercising. And I think another um, 
statement can be made here in my mind. There will be no financial market without blockchain, so banks have to deal with it. And I would even go so far to say there will be no bank without custody. Um, and therefore, at some point of time, any bank has to do it, right? Sooner or later. Excellent. Thanks much for the discussion. Um, in case the audience would like to get in touch, uh, then uh, please do so. I think we, there was an excellent panel with real experts from the tech side and the law side.